Hello, I'm Dr. Basil Considine. I'm here from the ACU Online Writing Center, and today we're going to be talking about how to identify stakeholders and to glean the implications of having these stakeholders and other things that come from research findings. So if you are new to the Writing Center, we offer a variety of services, including one-on-one -on -one appointments that you can sign up for, as well as webinars such as this, providing things like paper templates, dissertation feedback, and other elements of writing support. All of our services are completely free to enrolled students. We work with just about every program at ACU Online or the ACU Dallas campus. And if you want to sign up for an appointment, you have two basic choices, whether you want to have a real-time appointment or a non-real-time or asynchronous appointment. For an asynchronous appointment, you schedule a time. By the time that rolls around, you upload a copy of your paper and we send you feedback via email generally within 24 hours. And for real-time appointment, you will, by the time your appointment is started, you log in and to Zoom or be waiting at your phone, depending on which one you've picked. And then we will talk through everything starting at the scheduled time and you'll get your feedback in real time. Now, which you select is entirely a matter of preference. And a lot of students let their schedules drive that. If you are working till late in the evening, and then you want to just upload your paper and go to bed and then know, okay, within 24 hours, I'm getting an email with feedback and I continue working on that. If you're working proactively, that might be exactly what you want. If you are, say, uh, working on your draft and then you're like, okay, well, tomorrow morning, I'm going to be at church and then I'm going to be with family in the afternoon. So I'm not going to be looking at it anyway till next afternoon. Then that, 24 turnaround, 24 hour turnaround window might be exactly what fits your schedule. On the other hand, you might be thinking, well, okay, uh, I want to ask a lot of questions back and forth in real time, in which case a real time appointment is going to be the ideal for you. It's totally a matter of preference. Students will switch back and forth. Not a problem. It's all free. Uh, to sign up, you'd want to go to my.acu.edu and then on under resources, select the online writing center link and then just follow the instructions from there and then again after you schedule the appointment you'll want to submit a draft for that appointment uh, doesn't need to be terribly long before but if you have it ready when you sign up just upload it then you could always send us a newer draft but you do want to make sure you have your draft in by the appointment or if you're running slightly late to let the person you have the appointment with know and then you'll get the feedback Something that also might be of interest, if you are looking on our webinar guide, at the top there's a calendar of all the upcoming webinars for the semester. But if you scroll down a little bit, you'll find this tabbed guide where you can look at the different webinars by program. So for example, if you're in Leadership 701, you'll see that we have things sorted by the course number and then by the week of the assignment. So we have worked in conjunction with our faculty to identify uh, assignments that students tend to have more uh, trouble with or to request assistance with more and so we have developed webinars to let you get just that. We do have an APA course paper template that we do strongly recommend using. It simplifies a lot of the formatting by having the basic setup for you and having headings that will make it much easier to format your paper to look as it should for APA style. We have a YouTube channel that you can view many of our videos on on the go and we also have a blog where we explore various topics. So today we're going to talk about the stakeholder identification and gleaning implications through the lens of the literature search process because this is generally how people early on in their research will identify stakeholders. Now there are other ways of identifying stakeholders as well. You could do a focus group, you could do a brainstorm, you could go through a list of previously identified things. So for example, if you're looking at, say, the Parent Teacher Association and look at, okay, who shows up for those meetings, you've got a certain set of educational stakeholders there already. But often people are exploring topics that are going beyond what they know already. And so that's why we're going to be using literature search as a way of talking about these things. So we're going to start by delving into the literature search process. 
and talk about when to use a quick focus literature search, which is one type of literature search. Uh, the review the basic principles and talk about some additional resources. And along the way, we'll explore these questions about stakeholders and identifying what uh, having a particular stakeholder means and how to write about that. So when you're doing a literature search problem, it's always good to start with the question of what do you need? What are you looking for? And we'll just skip ahead and look at a rubric for an assignment that does ask for an additional source. So this is coming from an assignment in the EDD program where they ask for you to have an additional credible source. Now, what makes a source credible is a great question in and of itself. And let's say that some of the elements that are common to credibility are having some sort of authoritativeness. Is it someone who has worked in this field? Are they making claims that are backed up by data? Can we trace their work? And one type of uh, mechanism for identifying credibility is having gone through the peer review process, which you'll hear about later in the program, to have something published in a journal article format that requires that several people have looked at it and said, okay, this looks good. Now, is it infallible? No. <laughs> but is it a mechanism that is designed to produce higher quality research that is backed up by data? Yes. So it is a way of filtering through the mass of things. Now, a peer-reviewed literature excludes things like editorials, uh, opinion pieces, and such, although you may sometimes find those that are uh, very data-backed and will show your sources, but it's a fundamentally different approach to how you're presenting information and the process before it ends up in the public. So here's an assignment that requires that you have an additional credible source. So let's talk about what kinds of things goes into that. So if we're looking at what do you need, well, you're going to want to start with recent relevant literature that does something important for what you're doing, such as determines what has been done before. Are, are you trying to find uh, the best practice for a particular situation uh, that grounds a claim that supports what you are saying or that uh, supports a course of action that says, oh, yes, this is what we should do. And that can be more explicit or more implicit. But let's unpack the different components of that. So why recent literature? Well, for starters, there are many problems that are shaped by larger conditions that change over time. Uh, you might point at many different developments in US public education over the last couple decades, of which two very strong ones from the last two decades or so we have the No Child Left Behind Act of 2001, massive change in school funding and standards and standardized testing. And then there was the reaction to that with the Common Core State Standards, which started getting adopted around 2008 to 2010. And since then, well, first, not all states adopted those. And then second, uh, some only partially used it or have moved away from using some of them. So Minnesota, for example, adopted one of the Common Core standards and not the others, and some other states never did it. But if you're in one of those states that did adopt those, you, know, you could be looking at things from the 1990s, but how comparable, how directly applicable, there are just so many changes that have happened since then. Uh, as an example, to go back to Minnesota, uh, so Minnesota, you have a large uh, immigration of Hispanics from the last 10 years that has really transformed a number of rural towns where they weren't thinking about ESL uh, as a important curricular element. And now a quarter or more of the kids going to school are Hispanics, often from uh, backgrounds where they don't speak English at home. And so that's an example of a recent change that would mean if we were looking at information from the, the 1980s, it's like, oh, this town is 100% white, where that might not be relevant anymore. So we want to make sure that the general conditions of what you're trying to apply uh, are actually uh, recent enough that 
these are similar enough. And we also want to be cognizant that many theories, ideas, even survey instruments or study tools are modified and refined over time, sometimes due to changing conditions, sometimes they get better data, sometimes the meanings of words in practical use change, they want to update the language. So recent is a good place to start. If you're wondering what qualifies as recent, most professors will agree that last five years is generally recent, uh, but sometimes you'll have a matter that is so dependent on recent events again, that word, where you want to have something that's even um, more applicable. Uh, probably not in the ADD program, but if you were writing about, say, uh, Afghan refugee resettlement in the United States, that is something that has changed very considerably in the last two years. And so talking about what was going on even five years ago, well, the Taliban wasn't back in charge in Afghanistan then, so different set of conditions. So if you think that there might be a cutoff that has dramatically changed the landscape or important context. You probably want something that's more recent than that development. It's like looking at, say, telemedicine or homeschooling before COVID. Well, starting in uh, early mid-2020, there were a lot of changes in how that was being done. So it's not that you can't use stuff from before, but there's a lot of stuff that's changed since. So now let's talk about the question about relevance and what makes literature relevant. Basically, when you're looking for relevant literature, you're looking for something that has a known or a suspected direct bearing on what you're trying to do, uh, something that you can apply. Usually this is because it's addressed a similar problem or used similar methods to what you propose or was applied or especially validated in similar conditions through a data-backed reproducible process. And sometimes people will go with an authoritative source here. So for example, if you were, uh, say, studying different models of leadership that you might apply in a different situation, you say, oh yes, the author of this book, which has gone through 20 editions and is the standard in a lot of business curriculums, etc., etc. Uh, the author of this recommends that. Now, depending on your argument, you might want to have more in-depth discussion of that, or it might be a, okay, and this is why we're looking at this particular thing, and now we're moving to peer-reviewed journal articles on this. So how much you dwell on that, whether it's lead-in or whether it's the whole backing, that'll depend on the kind of thing that you're writing. Same thing with a lot of stakeholder stuff. Uh, you'll, you'll have a lot of that that's coming from an authoritative source where someone's authority is, oh, yes, I'm a researcher who did interviews with this many people, or I am a, you know, a, a professional uh, problem resolution specialist, and in my 20 years, this is what I can tell you who you want to have as your stakeholders. You know, what exactly makes them authoritative will vary, but if they you're looking at well, we want uh, and, uh, people who can resolve internal conflicts in public education di districts, and you have someone who is the go-to person in that state or region for doing that, and that they're normally invited in, and they say, okay, here are the stakeholders you have to have. Well, that is something where their professional backing is giving some support to that. Now, you might also have something where regulatory or other local traditions or practices is or requirements are governing things and so you are looking for something that meets that specific thing um, i went to graduate school in the state of massachusetts massachusetts developed what became the nucleus of the common core state standards they did not develop common core quite as the federal government practiced it and so if you are looking at the uh, different implementations you might say, well, okay, yes, this is after Common Core state standards, but we should really be looking at when the original Common Core was developed in Massachusetts. Or you might be looking at something that says, okay, well, this state, here's what's required. So, for example, in Minnesota, we have a uh, state open meeting law. So, you know, state business has to be open to the public. That may change who is willing to talk about stuff or 
who has to show up for things. And uh, so that does change what is possible. Uh, so whatever your regulatory or local conditions are may determine what relevant literature you are able to bring in. Now, one of the places this will manifest in practice is when you are backing up claims in your assignments, when you are citing literature and providing references to it in the references section as required in APA style. And so you're going to have parenthetical references in your writing that refer to authors and dates. And sometimes the author will be listed in the body of the sentence. And sometimes they'll be listed in the parenthesis with the date. But either way, you're going to always be telling us, oh, this information came from this source with the author name and the date there, and that'll key to information in your references. And if you're looking for more information about this, please check out our Intro to APA Style webinars, which you can view the recordings of, and we've got one coming up live this term. Now, when you are writing an assignment, you will probably also have instructions in the rubric at the end of the assignment instructions. And that will give you instructions, which are usually going to say, uh, yes, you are being graded in part on your APA style, and that includes having citations that are correctly formatted. So if you have questions about that, just go ahead and make an appointment with the Writing Center. We're happy to answer those questions. All right, so now let's talk about when to do a quick focus literature search, because there are different grades of literature search that come up. And if you are writing your doctoral dissertation, you're going to be doing something that's much more in-depth and exhaustive, and uh, where you're going to be documenting the process as part of your dissertation write-up. But for most assignments early in the program, you're going to be doing a quick focused search. And this is something that has a few advantages over the full literature review process. For one thing, it's a lot faster. Uh, it tends to be focused on recent literature and getting very relevant results. You're not trying to show you have found everything. It's about found things that are important and will inform what you're doing. Uh, downsides, you know, there is a kind of a, you're not looking for the absolute best thing. It's time constraint. Uh, you will tend to omit some older and sometimes keystone literature that you would want to be citing if you were doing a literature review and talking about the evolution of the ideas over time. And you're more likely to miss sources that are disagreeing because of the nature of it. And again, it's a question of, are you trying to do that full, exhaustive, balanced review? Or are you trying to emphasis, have an emphasis on the rapidity, recent and relevant, because you have other things to do? So some questions to ask, like, are you doing an exhaustive search within the constraints? Like, are you being tasked with doing something like a systematic or meta review or survey of literature on a narrow topic? Because if you were going back to the stakeholders thing, you would then be looking at saying, okay, so in these uh, 30 studies, these are the groups that they identified as stakeholders. And that's a lot of work. Uh, if you're doing a dissertation about stakeholders uh, for some particular problem, then yeah, you would absolutely want to do that. But for most assignments, that would be a, a little bit much. On the other hand, are you trying to get a quick sense of the available literature? Uh, what did this one author use? or perhaps these two or three sources. And if the first question is what you're saying yes to, then a focused literature sounds like a great idea. If the answer is no, then you probably want to do something more uh, rigorous, more time consuming. So let's talk a little bit about those literature searches, and then we're going to use this to bridge into looking at how to identify stakeholders. So some general principles. You want to start with the broad restrictions first, like say the date range. If you're going to be last five years, start with that. Uh, try a couple of different keyword combinations. Look at how things that you find that are relevant, including articles you've been assigned for the class, look at how they're tagged or labeled, and start with a small number and increase the uh, search operations that you're using. I'll show you what that means in a moment. 
So broad restrictions is like saying, oh, we're only going to look at peer-reviewed journal articles. Now it happens that most assignments are going to require that you only use peer-reviewed journal articles, so that's a good one to have by default. Uh, full text available, that means you can grab the whole thing from the library immediately without having to send away for it. Uh, recent literature, five years is a good place for, for starting for most assignments. Uh, probably you're going to be looking just in one language and probably you'll be looking at things that is are conducted or about conditions in the United States for your assignments. For your dissertation, if you're in the EDD program, you might want to go broader uh, because there may be they're looking for innovations in, say, international schools. But for most of the stuff that you'd be doing in the EDD program, you're going to be a little bit more locally focused. So you might want to have a geographic restriction. Now, there are a number of different ways that things can be written up. So if in doubt, try a different one or contact our library for assistance on this. And here's an example of how you might chain different terms together to get either collective leadership or shared leadership or the two of them together saying, either three of these will work for me. And then for we'll look at this in a moment for this looking at the different classifications of an article and see how it's been coded and how to find similar things, including who cited what. And this last one will work best if we're looking at this um, with an actual search. So there are two places that students will often start. One is with the distance education portal to use AC OneSearch. The other is to go to another outside resource like Google Scholar, which you can actually tie in with the ACU library system to access articles. Uh, but I'm going to recommend ACU OneSearch because it's very powerful and has a lot of options that will make this um, filtering process much faster. So let's go ahead and open up a web browser. All right, so we have the OneSearch portal pulled up here, and I'm going to start out by checking peer-reviewed. And I'm looking for information about stakeholders. And let's say I'm doing research in, let's pick South Dakota. And I'm just typing in some words that relate to the problem I'm thinking about. You may have a different stream here. But we're looking for something that has the word stakeholders, South Dakota, public education. Uh, if I want it to look specifically for public education, I should put that in quotation marks. So it's looking for those two words together and reform. And let's see what comes up. All right, so this has gotten us 373 results. And that is without our having some restrictions on it yet. So 373 for a assignment for one week is plenty more than we need. So we can try being even more particular. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to check the full text box. It'll take a moment to update and it'll tell me, oh, that's actually pretty much all of what I was looking at before. Great. Now let's go ahead and uh, make that more recent because I don't think that things from the 1990s are going to be super relevant to me. And my looking at ed education right now and see, okay, uh, just looking at the last five years or so, I s still have more than 100 results. Awesome. So now I can start looking and seeing uh, what I might be looking for here. Now, looking at this, we see uh, that some of this is about public finance, which is not really what I'm interested in. And some of it's about taxation. But ah, this one here, teachers union power in a budget crutch, lasting ramifications. All right, this is definitely something that uh, isn't of interest to my hypothetical topic. So I'm going to go ahead and click on this. And this will show me the catalog entry here. And now we, we see that although it's looking at the budgetary responses to the Great Recession, it's recent literature and has some other things that tie into what I, I'm looking at. And we see here, okay, they're identifying just in the title, teachers unions as a stakeholder in 
these different uh, spending responses to the Great Recession. So that's one thing I might use here and say, okay, these are stakeholders. Uh, but to make sure I'm understanding it correctly, I'm going to look at the abstract. And that's this text here. It's a kind of executive summary of what the article is about and what it's doing. In the wake of the 2007 housing crash and subsequent economic recession, state legislatures across the country faced substantial declines in revenues, and by 2011, for the first time in more than a decade, average spending on education declined. However, states' budgetary responses to the Great Recession were decidedly uneven, with some making lasting cuts to public education. This article uses longitudinal data on state-level educational spending, politics, demographics, economic well-being, and unique set of union strength indicators to assess the strength of teachers' unions as advocates for education spending by examining their role in states' varied budgetary responses to the Great Recession. So you can see that that took me just seconds to read through, and then you can make a decision about whether this is relevant to what you're doing or not. Now, in my case, I'm going to say yes. And I see there's school finance keyword. Ah, uh, you know what? I'm interested in that. Let me go ahead and open that up and see what else you might find here. Now, when you do that, you will want to reapply your filters here. So again, I want this to be more recent and I want it to be, in my case, limited to full text because I want to view it immediately. And I want it to be scholarly peer reviewed. And you'll see that we have 41 articles here. And there's even this research starter here, which is a, one of a set of different um, related resources recommended by the library catalog. So if you're diving into something and you feel like you need or you benefit from a, a kind of um, background review, something like that is a great resource. And I strongly recommend taking a few minutes to read through that if you feel that applies to you. So looking through this, you might see, oh, okay, ha, hold on. On where will that uh, lead me? And you might look and say, okay, um, Well, you might say, all right, this is giving me what I want because it's talking about educational choice and look through here and say, okay, what will the abstract tell me about this? And we have lottery-based evaluations. We have particular groups. And you might look at this and say, okay, um, I like part of this, but... I need that stakeholder thing more clearly. So you might go ahead and add something to the search and see, okay, uh, that's reduced our number of sources here, which isn't necessarily bad because we still have seven to look at. And again, most of these early assignments are just looking for one or two or two sources. So looking at this here, we have talking about finance reforms and about teacher-student relationships. So this is an administrator, so different potential stakeholders. So I might look at this and say, okay, uh, I want to go ahead and look for a full text for this. Can I read this right away? And so we have this, okay, we need volume 36, issue three, does progressive finance. So I can go ahead and click this Uh, alas, that didn't uh, get us where we wanted. But we've got another link here from Sage. So if you get a that the first time, but there's a second link, just go to that. And so we have here, we can download this as a PDF. There's a handy button for speeding up the citation process, although we would uh, want to uh, edit this slightly for APA style. And look here, and even if I'm just doing a, see, in this case, 
it's not largely focused on stakeholders. But look at this claim. Governors and legislators may reassert their faith in local school boards while downplaying the unequal political influence of stakeholders inside districts, along with rising budget shares going for non-classroom commitments. And we have this footnote here that will show us where that is referring to. And so it, it is coming out, uh, the claim is backed by this particular article here, which we can then look and see in the show all references thing, look and see, okay, this is where this is coming from. So that claim about stakeholders is actually coming from a newspaper or article. And that's something you'll find in a lot of school debates where a lot of the talking about who's involved may be in popular literature. And then there's the question of, okay, is that an appropriate source for what you are going to be writing about? And if the answer is yes, as you know, you may want to have more than one type of this source, especially a um, if you feel that it's a claim made in isolation. Well, if you get several claims from different sources saying the same thing, that is grounding it a little bit more. So on the other hand, if you have a peer reviewed thing where they looked at, uh, say, 10 different school districts and said, okay, here are the common stakeholders, then you might just find one article does that. But if this is something you were going to cite, great, uh, you know, you can take this and plop this, plop this into your references list. Uh, with very minor modifications. Uh, you need to add a comma after the last names and an ampersand between these two authors, and basically the rest would be uh, just fine as is in your reference list. And then you'd have author date, so Gutierrez and McBride, comma, 2018, as your parenthetical citation. So if you are looking for stakeholder information, and it happens to go outside a peer-reviewed source, uh, there are a couple different ways you can do it. Uh, one is to check with your professor to make sure, okay, um, this is this okay? This is the most relevant thing I found. Uh, for that kind of question, ask sooner rather than later, uh, because if you're asking the day that a paper is due, you know, that's short turnaround. Uh, the other option is to cite this article here uh, because it is relaying the claim and that's what we call secondary literature uh, and then the third would be to go ahead and cite this as being cited in uh, the original source and that's something that we talk about in our APA style webinar but if you have a question about how to do that feel free to email online writing center at acu.edu. So you may identify stakeholders for something in different um, contexts, and that's fine. Uh, you just want to make sure that you are citing the source appropriately for the requirements of your assignment. Now I could do something broad like education reform and stakeholders, and you can see how without having any other limitations. We're getting a lot of stuff. And this is talking about Chengdu in China, so that may not be relevant to what you are looking to check. So now, if I had here middle school, that will probably narrow down our results a bit. You can see it drops to 1,200 or so. Now, if we look at this one here, so stakeholders is in the keyword here. So if we were to look at, at this, we can get an idea of they're talking about a community school reform effort. And that's something that really does tend to need stakeholder involvement. And you can get an idea from the, the keywords that they're talking about, families as some of those stakeholders there. And so if this was the kind of thing that you thought was relevant, then again, you'd want to go ahead and grab a copy of the article using these links on the left-hand side. And then if we look at this here, we find that they're talking about 
community school was and the different uh, streams that make this more complex word search we can even do a word search for stakeholder and see one of the research questions was how do community school stakeholders explain the quantitative findings and jump to that portion to see who they're identifying as their stakeholders and here we have a list of the people that they group together into that school officials the community school lead partner parents and the community or refugee service partners ah okay so here's an example of stakeholders that they identified and so if your local context is similar to this you might cite this as backing for you're having a similar group of stakeholders all right some additional resources if you are looking for additional uh, guidance on searching for articles we have our article discovery webinar that I strongly recommend it does have at the end a discussion of an annotated bibliography assignment which is something that's usually coming out of a article discovery process uh, we have a dedicated webinar about annotated bibliographies and then another one about literature reviews for the next stage when you go beyond just uh, looking for information and for one uh, or two claims and you're looking at okay we're trying to look at a large number of sources and synthesize that together so different tasks different depths to the literature search process and so these are just a sampling of the webinars that we have available to help now if you have any questions including about how to do those secondary citations that i mentioned or about uh, different tasks discussed in this webinar, feel free to send us an email at onlinewritingcenter.acu.edu to sign up for an appointment online or visit the Online Writing Center to check out our templates, videos, and other resources. Have a great day.